Committee will resume. We recognize Mr. Turney from Massachusetts. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Sir, I want to I want to thank you for taking this responsibility. First of all, I uh, I think it's an en enormous undertaking, and I, I like your attitude about how you're going to approach it and uh, put your arms around things. And uh, I see it as I think you do as an incredible opportunity to try something new here, and extensive. And I'm particularly interested in the whole cloud sourcing aspect, or whatever you call crowd sourcing on that and the benefit it might uh, do for that. But first let me start by asking you, uh, there's been a lot of discussion here today about drilling down all the way from the federal money as it goes all the way down to the final sub-subcontractor at the local level. And that's all been conversation relative to what the computer will show. What do you see as the board's responsibility for tracking the federal monies? How far down should the board drill, just to the state level, to the municipal level, or beyond? Uh, I would say that, uh, you know, I, as I mentioned earlier, I want to go as far as we possibly can, uh, both legally and, pract I mean, if it's possible to get there. Um, and, and if it's not, I mean, there's, there's going to be um, a significant amount of auditing being done. And, and a federal auditor, for instance, can go all the way down right. and will have the benefit of any report or any review that they do will be published on the website. So, you know, that's another way you get down to the lowest level. So a state auditor or, or a city auditor's sure. reports will be available to you to right. put out there. Because right. you're going to have to leverage your resources, I assume. You're not going to have the capacity to do all that. There is no capacity to do all that. I think we have to be smart about how we deploy our resources. I think there's a... Um, I need to use risk-based models that suggest uh, that this kind of money is a little bit more risky than this kind of money and go over here first. So uh, we have to be smart about it. We have to try to get out in front of it and not just wait for the inevitable to happen. Yeah. I, mean, I, th I think you know this Congress for about eight years was in a coma when it came to oversight or whatever. I'm a little bit amused about some of my colleagues uh, now being so intense on it, but I hope they're serious about it uh, as we go forward. Uh, I, I think um, part of the issue is going to be municipalities and states having capacity as well to do it. Do you have presently in your design uh, of what's going on at the federal level the ability and the capacity to help train their people up to preventative those sorts of measures or do you need more resources or more legislation for that? Uh, I think um, uh, time will tell, but I'm definitely going to make that one of the first um, goals of the organization to develop that capacity to train, to, to um, distribute um, best practices, uh, to do everything we can for our partners, not only at the federal but the state and local level, to, to, uh, to help them get on the front end of this money. And um, that, I think, is a major mandate of this board. Do you see any substantial differences between the way that states and, and municipalities now have to report to the federal government with respect to non-recovery and reinvestment monies uh, that are allocated to them and with the recovery money itself? I think there are, I think it could be argued uh, fairly that there, 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 there are some additional reporting requirements being imposed. Um, whether or not they're so burdensome that it clogs the system down, well, just time will tell. I'm sure we'll hear about it. Did you have an opportunity to read Mr. Berto's testimony? The gentleman will be testifying on the second panel from uh, George Mason University. I did. You did? I did. Okay. You did or did not? I'm sorry. I did. Okay, thank you. It's my hearing thing on this. <laughs> I also think our microphones need some oversight here from time to time. They, they, <laughs> you, can't, you can't hear. Uh, do you have any objection? Are you comfortable with doing the types of things he's recommending in terms of working with people that are into this type of, uh, uh, of activity and making the data uh, as ex uh, useful in format, web friendly, machine readable, uh, aggregated, and uh, standardized, and all of those things that he's talking about? No, I have no problem with it at all. I'd love to sit down with him. Right. I, I agree. That's great because I think if we can do that, and if you're willing to, to work in that direction, we have not only our resources, but theirs as well. All right. And I, I agree with you. I'm just going to close out with this. Uh, I agree with you. This could be a model uh, for every government expenditure all the way down the line where we get the eyes of all the citizens out there and we get rid of the gotcha stuff. You know, where it's no longer going to be just like, gotcha, you're doing something wrong. Every company that spends 
uh, money has people that are looking to do abuse wa and waste and fraud. Uh, we wouldn't have the Wall Street situation going on that we had today if that weren't true. Every time there's government money expended, somebody's going to try it. Every time an individual has money, somebody's going to try it. And if we can get all the eyes on it, get rid of the gutcha stuff, we can just have a good, active, joint effort here where uh, citizens get involved and be on the front end of this. So I congratulate you again on your attitude for this. I wish you all the luck, and I look forward to working with you uh, on the committee for this venture. Thank, Thank you. you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, I recognize Gentleman Van, Van Hollen from Maryland. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And, Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding uh, this series of hearings on oversight. As uh, we know, we put protections, oversight protections in the bill to create uh, the oversight mechanisms, but obviously Congress has a very important role, um, as my colleague, Mr. Tierney, and you have uh, uh, said. And, and thank you uh, for taking on uh, this responsibility. I had a couple questions based on your experience in oversight uh, generally. Uh, and one of them relates to whistleblower uh, protections. The chairman of this committee and I, Mr. Platts, Mr. Braley and others, uh, have been pushing for greater whistleblower protections at the federal, state and local level. The bill we passed, the Economic Recovery Bill, does strengthen whistleblower protections at the state and local uh, level. We have some protections already in place at the federal level, but we are trying to strengthen those. We thought it made sense as part of a bill that contains $790 billion uh, in taxpayer money, uh, some in the form of tax relief, obviously, but the other in investment, uh, that we strengthen the ability of those Federal employees on the front lines uh, to uh, report uh, waste, fraud or abuse if they see it without fear of reprisal. Uh, because you can't be everywhere. The Inspector Generals can't be everywhere. So just, I, I know you may not have seen the legislation, but just as a general rule, uh, do you think it's important uh, to ensure that Federal employees and other uh, public officials uh, who see wrongdoing and are wanting and willing to come forward and report wrongdoing are, re are protected against any kind of retaliation. And how important is that in the oversight? I, I think it is very important, Congressman. And um, as I mentioned a little earlier, I have been a, um, somebody who has uh, designed whistle protection programs within my organization. I have not been bashful when I have seen retaliation to go directly to the Secretary. Um, so um, my attitude basically is um, we normally learn a lot from whistleblowers. It um, strikes me that the transparency piece of this will, will, um, will result in many more whistleblowers than we normally see. And we have to be very careful not to send any bad messages out there. And so I'm going to be vigilant about that. And when I see it, I'm going to ask my, you know, let's say it happened in the Department of Education, I'm going to make sure that the IG knows about it and we'll work together to try to, to cut it off. Um, I want people to come forward. Now, having said that, um, it's sometimes labor intensive to sift through the complaints and the concerns of whistleblowers to find that, to find that nugget. And, uh, and, but that's a process, and people people that um, know how to do that can be very helpful in this circumstance. I hope to hire some of those. Thank you. Uh, the other area I, I wanted to ask you about had to do with uh, procurement officers in the federal government, state, or local government. Uh, my view is even before the economic recovery plan uh, was passed, we were stretched very thin when it comes to federal procurements officers. You have one individual that has to oversee. Uh, lots of contracts, and even the best trained and you know best intentioned individuals uh, can have a difficult time monitoring all that. Even to the point where we started contracting out the responsibility for overseeing contracts, which creates a whole host of conflict of interest problems mm -hmm. and other issues. Uh, do you think it's important as we uh, go through this process uh, to try and bring on more procurement officers at the federal level so they? can ably and effectively deal with the huge increase uh, in contracts. Absolutely. And I think you are right. It is a, it's a major challenge to, um, to the capacity is just not there. Um, I think um, around 9-11 um, we were doing $200 billion of contracts a year and now we are doing $500 billion at the, and, and not to mention anything about the stimulus funds. And yet the increase in procurement specialists has remained flat. Right. So this puts the extra strain 
you know, that we obviously have to address. So the, the Act calls for the Board to, to look into that matter, to publish a report at some point. But I know that the departments are uh, aggressively looking for people, whether or not we'll find them or not. You know, ironically, the economy situation might help us find those kind of people, but there will, there will never be enough to handle this kind of money. Well, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I hope we can, as a committee, focus on that, because this was, as you know, a problem even before uh, we had the additional funds from the stimulus package, economic recovery package, and that is only added uh, to the burden. And as I said, you could have very qualified and well-intentioned people who just get an over, you know, more work than they can possibly uh, uh, follow uh, with resp in a responsible manner. The gentleman raised a very good point, which I am also very sensitive to as well, and we will we'll be looking at it further. Thank you very much. Thank you. Gentlemen, yield back. Okay. I yield now to the gentleman from California, Mr. Bill Bray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, God bless you. You uh, obviously been dropped right into, uh, I guess it was like an old movie, The Volcano. Um, look, I'm at, at a great position. I didn't support the Bush administration's proposal to spend a trillion, and I didn't support this administration's action on we have to vote on this up front. And as somebody who has been in government oversight um, since I was 25 in 1976, um, I think that we didn't do our due diligence, what was it, nine hours from the time we saw it to we voted, started debating it. Um, that means now we have to do due diligence. Now the oversight after the fact is going to be absolutely essential on this issue. And I hope we can work together in a bipartisan effort to make sure that we avoid the pitfalls with this legislation, as we are seeing today on the House floor with the Bush administration, um, uh, emergency spending that, was, that, that has created so much uproar among the taxpayers. I have got some questions to you. I just came from oversight and science and technology. So basically, I have talked to the people that you will be working with over at the other side. One of the things that have come, uh, the Chairman and I are really trying to work on and uh, is to make sure this administration doesn't fall into the pitfalls that the previous administration did and the mistakes. One of the big things that have not been talked about yet that I think we are going to hear in future months, though we have talked about the um, contracts in Iraq to for-profit organizations and the abuses there, we have not even scratched the surface of what happened in Afghanistan, especially with nonprofits, and that nonprofits traditionally do not get the type of scrutiny and oversight that for-profits have had. My question to you is that when we get down this line, are we willing to give, to concentrate and make sure that when we allocate monies to nonprofits, the oversight is as strict and diligent as we have um, hopefully done with for profit uh, uh, contracts? Well, I, you know, as an IG, I would never have differentiated between the amount of oversight I gave to a pro nonprofit versus a profit company. So I, I, as I sit here today, I can't think of why we would want to be any less vigorous in, in monies going to nonprofits as to other entities. Well, I give you one is the fact that we talk about um, cracking down and not giving contracts to those who are under criminal investigation um, where the business has um, at least uh, been uh, indicted or investigated or the, the fact is, is for wrongdoing. And when it comes to a private company, I think there's been an outroar about that. But then we've got nonprofits, and I'll be very blunt with you. Uh, California, the organization called ACORN, is really under investigation for major voter problems and for certain criminal activity. Um, how are we going to continue to move forward with con contracting with nonprofits that are under criminal investigation? Uh, even though we would not do that with a private for-profit um, for organization. Well, without, you know, addressing a specific company or organization, I, I think that, you know, certainly in, a, in any sort of a risk model, somebody that had those kind of problems would rise to the top. And if you were going to allocate resources to look at uh, the, the universe, you would, you would focus in on something like that. Okay. I, I only say this because I want to make sure we avoid that. And I, and I, I just seen the mistakes that were made, people thinking, well, because they are a nonprofit, we make assumptions. And people are still pocketing money one way or the other. There is no 
physical barrier from that. Let me sort of shift around and get on to something I think the Chairman would be more comfortable with. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, and it's a big concern. I just want to give you the heads up as you go down there because we talked about in science. When we are moving forward on this energy independence issue and this clean technology being tied into this, um, I hope you get your guys working for you to really take the time to touch base with the Energy Secretary and talk about what is really um, going to be energy independent and environmentally friendly technologies. Um, I just want to say for one, as somebody who comes from uh, serving on the Air Resources Board in California, that there are a lot of people who are going to be proposing contracts with you to, get, to use this money to perpetuate technologies. And one of them that has been really touted in the past is the use of ethanol as an environmentally friendly fuel. And I would ask that you get your experts to look at the fact that Duke University just came out with a report that said from a greenhouse point of view, it would be better never to plant the crop at all than to grow ethanol, uh, grow corn for ethanol. Uh, the other issue is the new Air Resources Board report, the number one um, air pollution people in the world that says that ethanol has no environmental benefit over regular gasoline. And I, I bring this up so that when these proposals come out, that we draw the line and say, wait a minute, this does not fall under greenhouse or green fuel. The only thing green about ethanol is the money being made about it. And I know those are harsh words, but it is absolutely essential that contract, we don't keep following that line. And if I will remind you that even if we talk about cellulosic ethanol, there is not the market and ability to use the ethanol that is being produced today. Right now, the industry is asking EPA to waive the 10 percent maximum in our fuel stream, and the EPA is stopping it because of environmental and, and, and um, operational difficulties on that. So I just want to say there is great opportunity for genetically altered enzymes to produce true green fuels, but please put it up. You see ethanol, take a second look at it and says, even with all the political pressure we can get, we don't want to have to line up in front of the Science Committee or the Government Oversight Committee and say, why did you give these grants out for a technology that the experts in California, the experts in the universities are saying are not a green fuel? Is that understood? I understand what you are saying. I, I think maybe um, that, that better is addressed to the EPA or the Energy Department. I am not representing the administration here. I am representing the, the board that oversights um, uh, to prevent fraud or waste. And that is, you know, if it arises in that arena, we will be, we'll be very actively engaged. And as a former mayor and council member, you sit like a council doing oversight to the city manager and the department heads. And that is why I want you to say that it is fraud and it is a, a waste if we take money that is specifically earmarked for green, clean fuels. And because we are not well informed, we end up sending money into a technology that is an environmental dead end um, and an economic um, disaster on the long run. So I just want to say that when he comes up there, now I am being squeaky wheel, so later I don't come to you and say, why did you spend money on this when you had all these scientific um, people coming out saying that this, this was a, um, a bad tra track to go. And I just want to say there are some great environmental opportunities out there. I hate to see us waste one dollar on a technology that is not environmentally friendly when there is all kinds of them lining up to do it. And I appreciate you um, allowing me to uh, pontificate on this issue. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. And just before we call in the gentlewoman from um, uh, Washington, D.C., let me just say that, you know, um, investigate, you know, I don't have, um, you know, a big, big problem with that because, I mean, investigations happen all the time, you know. Uh, but I think that the one that I'm really having problems with, uh, my good friend from California who we've worked on many issues together and worked together for a long, long time, but when we have situations where people have been debarred and they still get contracts, I mean, that, that, that's a problem. And then, of course, where you have the CEO of a company uh, that's been convicted 
and then the companies still get contracts for the government. I mean, those are the areas I have problems. I don't feel uncomfortable if you say that somebody is being investigated. I mean, that happens all the time. So I just wanted to share you with that, share that with you to let you know that uh, that doesn't bother me because I think that when sometimes when that happens, then that means that uh, the job is being done. And I think that uh, you know, when you mentioned a Acorn, you know, but you know, I, I must admit that. Uh, uh, Acorn, you know, uh, has done some great things in terms of uh, voter registration and, of course, being involved in the community. So um, uh, I just want to sort of share that with you. And, of course, uh, many people feel that it's an organization that deserves support. But so I yield to the gentlewoman from uh, Washington, D.C. I, I thank the uh, chairman for yielding just a, a word about the um, uh, the the ethanol. I'm not sure that that was directed to the right party. There's some of us who have a lot who have a lot of uh, trouble with the current um, the current source of, of ethanol because it has us eating gas, and there are a lot there are food shortages all over the world because corn is being eaten. Uh, eat is 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 a food. For uh, in many places, and now it's out of reach. Uh, whereas here, of course, uh, it's been so plentiful that <laughs> we've been willing to to drive on it. Uh, so uh, I don't. I'm not sure the the IG can say uh, until after the fact, perhaps, what's the right. And I certainly don't know what the right place is to look for biofuels. All I know is we got to look for some place other than corn. But my question really goes to what I'm sure are your responsibilities. Because the Recovery Act does or, uh, does authorize. In fact, it caught my attention that the Recovery Act, in particular, authorizes the IG to look at the the contracts, the subcontracts, the grantees, um, and e uh, all of that uh, that is done by local officials. It caught my eye because I see the Vice President calling out, telling people he's going to call them out if he goes and he sees that people are building swimming pools and other things that that nobody would expect uh, stimulus money to be used for. But many programs, not just the stimulus money, many programs of the federal government get up with a 50 percent, 80 percent. I mean, some get even uh, that, uh, that much, for example, for, for the Medicaid chair. So I, I'd like to know uh, if this is a new authority or if the uh, IGs also always have access to such records of contractors and grantees and subcontractees, sub some subcontract uh, tours uh, in who, who share in state and local uh, funds. I think the answer to that is we've always had, IGs have always had the ability to follow the federal dollar to wherever it went. And um, to that extent, these are not new authorities. Have you, know, have you known that to be done by uh, IGs? Absolutely. Can I ask you uh, how you think this will be done and whether this is beginning under this authority? Well, this I think looks like, it looks like what the, co what the Congress wants here is something pretty systematic. Well, I think that uh, we had a discussion earlier about the, you know, our our need and and um, just being smart about being redundant, so we don't want to be, you know, five different entities showing up the same day to look at the same money. So Agreed. we're going to have to be, um, you know, in a mode where we leverage our resources, make sure that um, you know there's a division of labor here that's appropriate between state, federal, and local. Um, but the fact of the matter is, um, you know, federal IGs have always had the ability to follow that money from its source down to its lowest level, and and often do in audits or investigations. Yeah, well, we'd certainly like to find it before the newspapers do. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I now yield to the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Speer. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, Sir, I just uh, read a story about you that was quite flattering uh, about how over many years you uncovered a lot of fraud, I guess in the Department of Interior, and it went um, un, um, un um, abated, I guess is a good word to, uh, to describe it, and eventually you left, is that correct? Uh, actually, um, you know, I've, I've been in the fraud field for you know, 28, 29 years. I started uh, 
in the Secret Service and eventually I was in charge of all of fraud for the Secret Service. And then I went into EPA and ran their criminal program and then I've been in IG for 10 years and fraud has always been a part of the portfolio and is always present when there's money around. I guess my question is, at some point were you frustrated where action wasn't being taken on um, issues that you had uncovered and, um, and if so, um, to make sure that doesn't happen again, what do we need to make sure is in place, whether it is more whistleblower protection, more subpoena power, uh, what do we need to do based on your previous experience where some of your efforts to uncover fraud were not addressed? Uh, I, I don't think that I was hampered in any way by not having the tools to uncover fraud. It, sometimes on occasion um, at the Department of Interior when um, I would uncover misbehavior, whether there was fraud or any other kind of misbehavior, I, I became frustrated and quite frankly rather noisy about uh, my frustration. Um, and um, got the attention of the, of the appropriate people and eventually things happened. But um, sometimes that is necessary. Sometimes it is necessary to have a congressional hearing um, and have an IG come in and talk about what he's uncovered um, and then have the department officials come as well as sort of the second panel. So um, I don't think there is a lack of tools. I, I think IGs have the tools. I think this act gives them the appropriate amount of money. We never have enough, I suppose, but a, a good chunk of money to do oversight. And, um, and they have set about smartly to get this done. And I am very impressed with the, um, their willingness to try to get on the front end of the pipeline and prevent fraud as opposed to simply waiting for the inevitable and going and detecting it. In the financial services arena, we saw a lot of bad actors in the subprime market and recently had a hearing in which we found that in the uh, Federal Housing Administration, many of those bad actors had just moved over to provide FHA loans. And the, the directorate of FHA said he just didn't have the resources at the time to preclude them from participating. Now, we have since put language into one of our uh, bills that we have moved this year to address that. But I guess my question is, when you, when you have a, 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 a volume of bad actors out there, they have done business with the Federal Government, we found out they were bad actors, um, many of them are in a position where they just change the name of their company, come right back uh, to try and do business with us. Do we have a database of bad actors out there that we can rely on? Should we have one? Um, could you comment on that? Well, um, most departments, as you probably know, have a suspension and debarment programs and they get put on a list. Um, but, you know, it has been my experience that, that people who commit fraud sort of follow the money. And there is no doubt in my mind that with this amount of money on the table, they will come. Um, the challenge for all of us is to leverage our resources in a way that allows us to um, get at the fraud that will undoubtedly occur. Um, I view the transparency piece of this, this act as a big help to investigative bodies because we are going to have hundreds of millions of, eye, of eyes and ears that we don't currently have in the traditional process. So um, we are undoubtedly going to hear more from citizens about fraud or reporters that they have uncovered uh, fraud by, by looking at the website and by understanding that that contract does belong to somebody's brother. And, um, and tell us about it than we would under the traditional way, which is sort of we sort of stumble upon it or we go out and we find a, a small amount of it. Well, I would agree with you. And I think the transparency in this process is unlike any transparency we have seen right. ever. And right. it should be that transparent because it is so much money. Um, so I just commend you. I just want to, um, as one member, to suggest that uh, if it is time to raise the red flags, whether you need more resources or you believe a hearing would be helpful, um, that you, you call upon us um, so that we can be helpful to you. I yield back. Thank you very much. We now yield to the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Clay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will attempt to be brief. Uh, Mr. Devaney, the uh, RAT Board's website is uh, supposed to provide a means for the public to provide feedback on the performance of contracts uh, relating to the stimulus funds. 
can you explain whether there will be transparency on the actual uh, public feedback itself? Well, we we um, we don't actually have control of the website yet, but when we okay. do, we will be looking at the comments that come in, and I suspect we will have a process which involves um, perhaps not providing you know, uh, notification of all the feedback we have gotten, because I think I mentioned earlier we are getting 3,900 hits a second on this website. So, but we will have a process where we see, if we see a systemic problem that is developing, I am going to want to be very proactive about getting that out there so that, so that uh, you know, not only my fellow IGs and, and, and colleagues at the state and local level know about it, but so the citizens can see that that is becoming a problem and that we are addressing it. Well, let me, let me ask you about the, uh, what the states, local communities and um, uh, independent organizations, are they aware that you know, that the uh, Recovery Act put emphasis on um, uh, targeting this money towards economically distressed communities. Uh, and it also put some emphasis on involving small businesses. I mean, are these, are, are these communities and states aware of that? Or how will, just how will they be uh, apprised of, of the emphasis that the Act puts on economically distressed communities and small business. Congressman, I was asked that question um, earlier today and I, and I responded by saying that I am not really um, fully aware of, the, um, uh, of how that, the Act addresses that issue and I would get back to that person. I would be glad to include you in that response. Okay. All right. Well, I thank you and I have no further questions. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. Um, let me just say this to Mr. Devaney before we um, conclude. Um, will you be able to report back to this committee within two weeks with a full report on both the initial set of stimulus uh, contracts and an overview of the fraud prevention programs in place? Could you do that? Um, you know, I certainly heard that request at the beginning of the hearing, and uh, as I've been thinking about it, I think the the fraud prevention aspect of that is an easier r response than the other one, and I would ask your indulgence if I can't do it within two weeks. I'll let your staff know about it, and we can maybe work on that. Uh, the, the second one, the second one's a little bit more comprehensive. It's also one where we would have to go to the agencies themselves as opposed to just the IGs. Right. Well, thank you. If you can, you know, we would we appreciate that. Thank you. And let me just say that you know uh, we're delighted that you are where you are. Um, as I indicated early on, that um, everyone is saying that if it can be done and done properly, you can do it. So I want to let you know that whatever we can do here from this committee standpoint, we stand ready to do that. You know, if, if, if it's fight for more resources, you know, we stand ready to fight for more resources with you because quite often that people in a position, you know, uh, will not have the tools to be able to do the job that they're called upon to do. We want you to know that we stand with you to try and make certain that you have the resources because we want to really deal with this whole waste, fraud and abuse. As it was pointed out earlier, $55 billion, you know, uh, wasted, you know, not going and doing what it's supposed to do. We want to assure you that we want to bring that number down. And we, with your help, I'm confident that we can bring it down. So thank you very, very much for your testimony and we look forward to working with you. Thank you, sir. Right. No further questions. Right. Thank you.